Um, I'd like to invite up um, Dr. Dadarlet uh, for the next talk. Thank you. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. So today what I'm going to be talking about is a project that we're just embarking on actually. Uh, we just joined the Indiana CTSI family this summer. So in contrast to other great talks we've had today, we have a lot of ideas that we're embarking on and then a little bit less data. But I think this is a good time to start to get feedback from the community about what's going to happen. Um, so this project is happening in collaboration with uh, Dr. Ann Sereno, uh, who's also a professor in uh, biomedical engineering and psychology at Purdue and was really initiated by our joint student, uh, Elizabeth Fraser. So I should say uh, Anne is our TBI expert, whereas I'm more of a systems neuroscientist. Just disclaimer. All right, so what I'm talking about today is our idea to look at developing a novel behavioral task to determine physiological level damage following mild traumatic brain injury just from psychophysics. So psychophysics refers to the idea that you can infer how humans are processing sensory information just from their behavior. All right, so as we just heard, traumatic brain injury is sort of a major problem within the United States. It's a major health issue with about 2.8 million TBI sustained annually. That's just under 1% of the United States population uh, incurring one of these injuries per year. And they can happen for a variety of reasons, such as, let's say, falls, traffic accidents, being struck by or against an assault. Um, and they also have a wide variety of outcomes, ranging from very severe, where you see people being in a concussion for more than 24 hours, to what we classify as mild, where you have very minor period of unconsciousness. Now, some 80% of traumatic brain injuries are actually classified as mild. And even within this one category, you see a really vast difference in the type of injury that is actually sustained. All right, so what we're gonna be talking about today, oh, sorry, so let me point out one, one other thing. So not only is there a vast difference, these mild traumatic brain injuries are often characterized by not having any detectable cortical or brain damage. So using the sort of standard protocols of uh, a CT scan or an MRI, it's not really obvious what type of damage has been done. So what we're thinking about is how can you develop a sort of very low cost, simple on test, uh, on site test to predict patient outcome and level of mild traumatic brain injury for individual patients. And ideally what we're trying to do is develop a behavioral biomarker that lets us infer functional physiological cortical damage following mild TBI just from behavior. All right, so what we're proposing to look at is actually the visual processing system and use that as a sort of marker for uh, damage in mild TBI. And this is a really useful system because it turns out some 90% of TBI patients have some form, form of visual dysfunction, ranging from uh, blurriness all the way over to difficulties with eye movement. So one way to test this that has been common is to look at eye saccades made by these patients. So a saccade is when you move your eye across visual space to take in the visual scene. So uh, a test for a saccade would be, okay, a patient is looking at a screen and they have to move their eye to a target, like here. You can also test cognitive control with the same type of protocol by adding in what's called an anti-saccade. So now you have a target appearing on, on the screen, but you have to control yourself. And instead of looking at that target, you have to look at the opposite direction, anti-saccade. Now, the problem with these kinds of tests is it actually requires a significant amount of equipment, you know, so cameras and algorithms to actually do the eye tracking. And then you also have to calibrate to every single individual patient in order to track their eye movements. Um, so as an alternative to an eye tracking task, task and developed a sort of sensory motor based tablet task. So now instead of tracking eye movements, you present a stimulus to the patient and they can just report by moving their finger on a tablet or computer screen and move to a target. And we can also add in the sort of cognitive component where instead of a point task where you're moving your finger, you have to move in the opposite direction 
to the target, so an anti-point test. So we're going to build upon this idea here in order to test visual processing as a behavioral test for mild traumatic brain injury. All right, so how does visual dysfunction manifest, manifest physiologically after traumatic brain injury? Well, one useful thing I wanted to tell you about is that normal visual processing is actually hierarchical. So what that means is it actually happens in stages across different brain areas, going from what we call, let's say, the primary brain areas to the higher brain areas. And what happens is, let's say you're trying to take in this a complicated visual scene. At the early stages of visual processing, you're pulling out really simple factors like orientation within a little part of space, color, contrast, uh, ocular disparity, all right? So that's what happens first. And then as you go to the intermediate stage of visual processing, you start to put all these little orientations together to come up with something like a contour outline, right? and so on for the other factors. And at the highest stage of visual processing, you have something like this, where you finally identified the object. All right, but what happens is that if you get faulty behavior at these early stages, you're going to have faulty outcomes at the higher level stages. So the fact that this visual processing is hierarchical, it actually gives us an opportunity to sort of test at which stage or which level people are having difficulties with this visual sensory processing, right? And that in turn gives us sort of mechanism to figure out at what level do you actually see physiological damage? All right, so the assay we're going to use is a higher level visual function. So it comes together again at the late stages of visual processing in the later part of the visual hierarchy. And it's called processing of complex motion. So what complex motion is, it's a sort of perception of motion that emerges from the, um, from the action of a body of elements rather than a single element itself. So a nice example of this that's seen in nature is a starling rumoration. And we have these in India, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, but what you see is you see a coordination of like a thousand birds flying together in a complex formation, right? But if you look at any single bird by itself, you can't infer this big global complex pattern, all right? So that's an example of complex motion in nature. And we can sort of approximate this sort of complex motion in the lab by using what are called random dot kinematograms, all right? And so a random dot kinematogram, it consists often of a, a body of dots upon a black background, and they're moving across the screen, all right? So any single dot actually only lasts on the screen for a few lifetimes, all right? So you can't track the movement of a single dot. You can't infer the motion of this visual signal from a single dot. You have to look at the entire body. And so we can make this test more difficult by changing what's called the coherence. So the coherence is the number of these dots that are actually moving in the same direction. So now I'm gonna, I showed you 100% coherent motion. It's really easy to figure out what's happening. Now I'll show you an example of 50% coherent motion. It's actually more difficult to pull out the global motion direction from 50% coherence. And you can go all the way down to 0% coherence. And in 0% coherence, there's no global net motion. It's kind of just um, noise at this point. All right, so we can make this global motion task easy or hard depending on the coherence that we choose. All right, and so the experiments that we're doing, we're actually doing in the mouse. We're using the mouse as our animal model uh, for a number of reasons. And one of the major ones is that the mouse has been essential for systems neuroscience because of all the genetic tools that we have available. So this means that we've been able to map out specific circuits and figure out what specific subtypes of neurons and specific areas of the brain are doing, all right? And despite the sort of traditional view that mice do not have good vision, mice are blind, all the way back in 2008, uh, it was found by recording from single neurons within the mouse visual cortex that actually these neurons look a lot like the neurons that we see in higher animals that have been traditionally used for visual studies, so the cat and monkey. They have a lot of the same properties, they have a lot of the same responses to visual input. And particularly useful for us right now is that it's actually been shown that mice can do this type of coherent motion processing. So if you put a mouse in a little behavioral chamber and ask him to choose 
touch one of two little touch screens, okay, and report a rewarded coherent motion direction, they can actually learn to do that at pretty high accuracy. And what's more, if you look in the brain, so here's a little picture a schematic showing this is the primary visual cortex and these are the higher visual areas. If you look at neural activity within these visual areas of the mouse cortex while they're viewing coherent dot motion, you see that up here where they're in the yellow, uh, these neurons, their activity is actually relatively well correlated with the coherence of this global dot motion. So now we have a nice behavior for high level visual function. And we also know that, hey, these mice, not only can they do it, we can actually figure out where this is happening and where we should be looking at to record neural activity in this context. All right, and so what we are doing in our experiments is that we want to be able to probe sort of low level function right now. Because when you probe low level function, by that I mean single neuron recordings, you can see minor changes that you miss when you have to do sort of more global recordings. For example, non-invasive recordings. Uh, and we're gonna use electrophysiology. And what that means is we're gonna actually record the electrical signals that each neuron generates as they're active within the brain. And our goal, again, is to establish a link between the neurophysiology that we see, how are these neurons behaving pre and post uh, mild traumatic brain injury, and the psychophysics, so the actual behavior, how well can the mice perceive this complex motion. And our goal, again, is to figure out a rela this relationship so that we can infer physiological damage in mild TBI just from behavior. All right, so I will go through a series of questions and sort of give you the idea and then methods and then what results we have. So. The first question we're trying to figure out is, well, how does the behavioral readout of visual perception depend on the coherence of this global dot motion? Remember we said, as you lower the coherence, the number of dots that are moving in the same direction, it becomes much more difficult for, uh, for you to per perceive the global motion. So we came up with a little behavioral task where mice are playing a video game. And the goal of the mouse is to what's called zero out the dot field. I call it a dot field for simplicity. Uh, and so what's happening is that the mouse is sitting here and he, he's putting his little paws on a wheel. And then for about 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 seconds, it's uh, somewhat randomized, he's going to see a visual stimulus. So he's going to see the global dot motion. And then he's going to hear a start tone, beep, and then he's allowed to turn the wheel. And his goal is to turn the wheel opposite to the dot motion. And the movement of the wheel actually controls the speed and direction of the dot motion. All right. So if he turns it, you know, if we have a dot field motion to the right and he turns his wheel to the left, he can slow down the movement of the dots to zero. And if he does that successfully, he gets a little reward. So here we have a video of a mouse doing just that. Here's a little snippet of the screen zoomed in. And here is the wheel and his paw. And you're gonna see, so the dots are slowing, 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 beep, he gets a little reward and he licks and then he starts on. And these mice actually really like doing this task. So Elizabeth told me she had a mouse that just got full and then he stopped caring about the reward and he went on for hundreds more trials because they really think it's fun and interesting. And it is. All right, and so to our surprise, you know, it seems like a kind of complicated task for a mouse to do, but they actually learn how to do this relatively quickly. So if we look at trading day here on the x-axis and the fraction of correct trials on the y-axis, each one of these little dots is a training session. All right, so 0.5%. In this task, the dot field can only go in one of two directions. So chance is 50%. But even within the first few sessions, we see that animals start to learn this task. And if you take the average across all 40 or 38 training days, what you see is that you get up to about 80% accuracy. So Elizabeth is training these mice up to about three days in a row or three sessions in a row of more than 80% accuracy before she goes on to do electrophysiological recordings, just to make sure that these are truly expert mice. And you might wonder what's going on here. Well, they are more or less motivated across days. So for an individual mouse, it can be noisy, but once we know that they're doing well, we'll go ahead and do recordings. All right, so actually let me back up for a second. 
All right, so uh, we train them on high coherence trials, okay? We wanna make it easy, encourage them. But then when we go to test dot field uh, perception, we do a variety of coherences ranging from zero all the way up to 80%. And not surprisingly, uh, the accuracy with which the animals can perform this task is proportional to the dot field coherence. So all the way down at zero, they're performing at chance. But as you get higher and higher, we're about 80% accuracy, which is pretty much what we can ask for. All right. So this brings us to our second question. Now that we know that animals, uh, healthy animals, can perform this task, how does mild traumatic brain injury actually impact visual perception at the behavioral level? And I'll tell you, I don't have that answer just yet. We're still working on it. Um, but we're working on inducing uh, our model for mild traumatic brain injuries are to use controlled cortical impacts with a closed skull. So we peel back the scalp and then deliver an impact with a little pneumatic uh, probe to the back of the head. All right, so that would be a clinically relevant model that mimics falls and injuries to the back of the head, which just so happens to be where your visual cortex is located. All right. And so what we expect is, okay, if this is the healthy mouse performance, we think that mild traumatic brain injury will reduce trial accuracy. All right, so you might expect, okay, we get a little bump, and now instead of hitting chance at 0% coherence, we're going to hit chance at 20% coherence, you know, and maybe if the injury is more severe, now we're going to see we're going to reach chance at an earlier or higher coherence, and so on. So what we expect to find may or may not, is that the severity of the traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury is going to uh, be proportional to this behavioral readout or the coherence at which you get chance level performance. All right, so, so that was one stage. Now we have the psychophysics, the mouse behavior, sort of established and ready to go for traumatic brain injury. The other sort of component is, in this project is thinking about how do neurons in these visual areas actually respond to coherent dot motion on a single neuron level? Uh, and then after we get that, we're gonna say, how do these neural responses change after mild traumatic brain injury? Okay, so the way we're gonna do this is that we're gonna train the mice until they become experts, and then we're gonna record from their brain. So this is a semi-acute preparation. So we actually make a little craniotomy and then we implant either one or two 128 channel micro electrode arrays and we're targeting here's the mouse uh, cortex of the different areas we're targeting primary visual cortex and parietal cortex uh, and so here's an example of what we're looking for so each one of these 128 channels is going to give us a signal like this and this is actually filtered so we got rid of low frequency components but we're really looking for right now are these things right here and these are action potentials right and so for a neuron an action potential is the unit of communication the way it passes information along to its neighboring targets neighboring neurons and downstream targets all right so here are some just some sample recordings all right and so what are we going to actually be looking for in these recordings that we're making uh first we're going to look at single neuron responses to this random dot kinematograms, all right? So here's an example. This is just a single neuron, and we're looking at each one of these little dots is an action potential, okay? And this is as a function of time. And so we have multiple rows because these are multiple trials. So what we're looking at is how does, how do neural responses to these random dot kinematograms change as a function of direction of the global motion. And so this neuron does not seem to be particularly selective. There's not a huge obvious difference in uh, responses to movements. But what we expect to see when we record from enough neurons is something like this. This is a, this is a classical response of a neuron to movement in different directions. So what I'm plotting here is different movement directions. And here I have firing rate, which is how many of these action potentials that a neuron give in response to the visual stimulus. And so classically, neurons are tuned to movement direction, which means that they have high firing rates, high responses to some movement directions, and they really don't care about others. So this is a neural tuning curve. And what we're hoping to see, or we expect to see based on the literature, is that compared to, let's say, a baseline tuning curve in a neuron, obviously this is my cartoon, this is real data, compared to a baseline tuning curve 
in a neuron following traumatic brain injury, we're going to see reduced levels of activity, so the peaks are lower, and also weaker tuning, which means that these neurons are not as responsive or they're less responsive to changes in movement direction. So that's what we're looking for single neurons. Uh, but we're also going to be analyzing how information is transferred across these different cortical areas. So again, thinking about hierarchical processing of this complex motion. So we're going to be looking uh, based on data that shows that there's a loss of inner area connections within the cortex following mild traumatic brain injury. What we expect to see is that all right, not only are neurons in these areas not going to be as well tuned to movement direction of the global motion, but we also are going to see much weaker correlations between neural activity in the two areas and lower transfer of information. So ultimately, what we hope to do with this data set is to establish a really strong relationship between, again, the neural activity that we see. So how do neurons respond to this global motion of the dots with less or more severe traumatic brain injuries? And how does that directly translate then into behavioral performance on this dot field task? And this is all in service to our sort of longer term vision that uh, Anne's lab will be able to implement of repeating the same kind of structure in humans. So once we know what happens at a sort of single neuron level, and we've pinpointed some cortical areas that are of interest and really show physiological damage that maps onto behavior, we're going to do non-invasive recordings in humans that are performing the exact or similar type of task, but now using a tablet or cell phone. And the idea behind this is, again, what we want is something that you can do at home, you can do on the field, you can take to the sports field, and then you take it at home and then you follow your progress of damage by yourself by doing this task periodically. And again, the idea is that we want to just be able to use simple behavior to measure physiological damage and do long term tracking of physiological disruption following mild traumatic brain injuries. So that's all I have. Thank you for listening. That's great, very engaging talk, and I can already envision a center grant across these different projects that have been presented because of the nice synergies across the science and the methodologies that you're using. I see there's maybe one quick question, and then we'll move on to our final speaker. Uh, Ashay Bhattwadekar from Ophthalmology, Indiana University. I have one quick question, a uh, really great talk. Uh, can you comment about uh, systemic disease like diabetes uh, in context to the model that you have shown in terms of dots, uh, how it is of going to affect, Could just you an example. The first part? I'm so sorry. The systemic a disease like diabetes or like other eye conditions like age-related macular degeneration, where we know that there is a change in visual acuity. That's a great question. I actually don't know the literature as well for for um, diseases like this, but I do know that this does show up in a lot of uh, neurological diseases where you see changes in connectivity around uh, across brain areas. So for example, autism, it's been shown that autistic patients have problems um, processing complex vision. And we think that you know they have problems with social interaction and it might emerge from this sort of low level activity. So it's also possible that, you know, one of the things that is, is true is that if you have really low level difficulty, so macular degeneration, that's a really early stage problem. So that's going to perpetuate all the way back up to global motion. So it might just always be bad. But that being said, I actually don't know that literature that well. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Oh, you, you have another question, Joel. Well, I guess you get navigator privilege. Go ahead. <laughs> gave them some TBI can uh, recover, especially those that are high performers. So after you test them, you give them some TBI, do they recover over time? And the second question that relates to, uh, it's there's an association between uh, dementia and uh, eye impairment. And it's a, it's a big thing at the National Institutes on, Age, on Aging. And so I'm wondering if you've thought about those kinds of things as far as what you're doing, 
uh, down the road? Three questions. Uh, so I have not, but now after this discussion, I'm definitely going to <laughs> as soon as I get home. Um, and the other question, to address your other question, so I'm leaving out a lot of the details because I want you all to go to Elizabeth's poster after these talks yes. and hear about the details of the project. But we haven't tested recovery behavior in these mice, but we're going to give them about 30 days to recover. And we are going to give them a series of tests. So sort of after the, the induction of the mild TBI, we're going to put them through a, a standard set of um, behavioral tests to assess motor function, um, cognitive function, novel object rec recognition, social interactions, so things like that. And then we're going to periodically test them on novel object recognition. Uh, and then about 30 days after, we're going to do the actual test. So we will give them a little bit of a chance to recover. Thank right, you. Thank you. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, hello, Dr. Zigby. <laughs> Maria, this was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, I think following up on the question, if you've got macular degeneration or anything that compromises vision, that's one thought. The other thought is, as you know, the trauma could happen any part of yes. the brain. And the more, since you're going to do a center grant, the more we have maybe capture other parts the better. And at Purdue, I met some of your colleagues who work in the hearing and ear. I wonder if one could adapt a similar, you know, assay, but now recording from, you know, the auditory cortex and combining vision and hearing and, you know, to capture really everything. I'm just curious, is this impossible or could it be done? Yeah, and that's a great idea. I, I would really love to see that happen, as you say, especially since our colleagues have uh, more direct sort of clinical applications where we could really test it. But, but yes, um, in fact, there's somebody else in my lab that's looking at changing frequency. So the frequency of an auditory si signal to take them, to take mice to a particular target. And that's a sort of freely moving task, but it could naturally translate to here. And then there are different ways that we can induce noise into that system to make it much more difficult to complete the task. So that, that's a great idea. And I'll just say one last thing before I leave. Uh, Multi-sensory integration is also a really major factor that's impaired in neurodegenerative diseases. So not only TBI, but also, again, autism um, and probably others, probably dementia. So I think that's also something we're going to look at in the future. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm so glad that the audience